This lecture is on cardiac editing techniques. My name is Lior Mulvin, and we're going to go over some things that we've had questions about here at Stanford Healthcare. So today we're going to go over an overview of cardiac scan modes, specifically retrospective gating. We'll identify the best recon phases based on the heart rate and cardiac variability. We'll learn how to adjust ECG sinks. We'll apply relative percentage values and millisecond unit values. We will review how to identify cardiac artifacts in relation to the ECG. And we'll look at a few future cardiac CT technologies that are being implemented at Stanford Healthcare. The coronary angiography is a very powerful tool because it allows us to identify if there are areas of disease processes. And in, in this picture, I have an example of a calcification and I can measure down to the millimeter uh, how large that calcification is and how narrow the lumen of that vessel uh, is becoming. And we want to identify if there's a stenosis in any of these vessels that's 50% or greater, generally speaking. That's the goal of CT and cardiac imaging. And here's an example of a stenosis that is more than 50%. You can see it's very narrowed, and then there is a soft plaque, a rupturable plaque that could potentially break off and then subsequently block one of these diagonals uh, distally, and that could cause a myocardial infarction, otherwise known as a heart attack. So before we start talking about editing, I want to talk about contrast phase. You can't edit a bad bolus. So I've got an example of a bolus that's correct where all of the contrast has been injected and it's all on the left hand side. The contrast is going through the aorta and outside uh, into the coronary arteries and the uh, descending aorta. You can see there's no contrast in the pulmonary arteries, just in the pulmonary veins. Conversely, I have another example over here where I have contrast in both sides of the heart. You can see there's more contrast in the left side of the heart. It's mixing here than in the right side of the heart. And this little squiggly line here, this is the right coronary artery, which is out of phase. But I can't edit that because I don't have enough contrast signal in that tiny vessel to be able to view that coronary artery. So bottom line, you can't edit a bad bolus. Now, we have several injection strategies here at Stanford Healthcare uh, that we break off, and this is our quick sheet that we use to reference uh, contrast injection strategies if you don't want to open the 200-page protocol book. And the cardiovascular session by far is the largest. But the part that I want to address is right here, where our standard injection durations equal our scan times and our scan delays. That's our standard injection strategy, which will get the contrast into the target area. Uh, we'll also use a uh, sub uh, second scan mode for the flash mode or single detector or single rotation wide detector mode where our scan delay is equal to two thirds of our injection duration. We'll never want to use this if our scan time is more than four seconds. Now, here's an example of uh, what I like to think about when I'm evaluating uh, a cardiac scan. Well, you can see that the heart is filling with blood. And this blood volume model over here, you can see that uh, at the end of systole, the heart is essentially uh, starting to empty. And then in diastole, it's starting to fill. And then there are two areas here between 30 and about 45, 50% where uh, there's relatively little motion here. And then there's another area over here between 70 and 80% of the R to R interval uh, that has very little motion as well. That's not moving. Now, this electricity uh, causes to beat right here. And then this is a passive filling portion of the heart. And so there's motion in these ramps. And we just want to be mindful of those ramps and try not to image during those ramps. So we have these two areas, this flat area in systole and this flat area in diastole. Now we can look at the heart in terms of percentage values. So we can say if this is one R peak and this is the next R peak or the next heartbeat, well, we can just break that down into a percentage value and say that's 40% between this R peak and this R peak corresponds to this low point in terms of the lowest blood volume. And I could then say 
at 70%, there was very little motion in terms of the actual heart volume filling with blood. And so those would be good places to look in terms of getting good images. You could also break it down in terms of the amount of milliseconds after an R peak. And so down here, you can see that we have these millisecond values. So we have 802 milliseconds is the length of the uh, heartbeat, and this is 89 milliseconds. We're roughly between 260 and 350 milliseconds is a really good place to look for uh, area for images that aren't moving. Now, if you take this blood volume map and then you superimpose that over the ECG, you can start to see patterns, right? So that area in Sicily where there is very little motion, uh, that corresponds to the end of the T wave. And then the area in diastole that looks really good that has relatively low motion is right there on the P wave itself or right before the P wave. Um, those are generally the best places to look for low heart rates. Now, the problem with most CT scanners is that you can't actually cover the entire heart in one uh, rotation. And so you end up taking a set of pictures and that corresponds to the detector coverage the system has. And generally speaking, a 64 or 128 slice scanner will have about a four centimeter detector. So you're gonna have four centimeters at a time. And each time your table moves and takes another picture, you get another four centimeters. Now, if your heart isn't exactly the same size and shape, then you're gonna have an artifact and it's not gonna quite line up together. Another thing that this picture is showing you is perspective imaging mode. It's a step and shoot imaging mode that allows the computer to try and predict when the heart will be stable to take its picture. And this is a really good way to image the heart. Uh, this is a low radiation dose imaging mode. Generally speaking, you can add a little padding so you can image longer than the amount of time it takes to take the picture. Uh, and that way you can pull from a different phase of the heart cycle. So let's say you want to do 30% and 35% of the heart cycle, or you want to do 250 milliseconds and 300 milliseconds and 350 milliseconds, you can widen the exposure window so you can extract information from those parts of the heartbeat. Pretty interesting. I would say that there's limited editing here because whatever image you take, uh, you're stuck with that. And so if the heart is a different size and shape because you have a, a different heartbeat, whether you have a faster rhythm or a shorter rhythm for that period of time, uh, you're kind of stuck to that four centimeter gap or whatever that detector width is. Uh, and that goes away when you have a wide detector system because there are no gaps. It can image the heart in the entire, uh, in one rotation. And so you can see the entire heart. Now, generally speaking, the wide detector is going to give you better images when you have heart rate variability uh, and when the heart rates are really low. And um, on some of the newer scanners, you can actually adjust the exposure to increase when you know that there's not going to be motion and decrease outside of that and still capture the entire cardiac cycle, which is really interesting. So you can reconstruct from anywhere from here. Now, when you're looking at what type of cardiac scanner you want, the wide detector sounds really good because you don't have any of these merge artifacts, but you can also use dual source technology, which allows you to capture the images faster. So how does that work? Well, if you take a CT scan of the heart, you're generally using half of that circle. So 180 degrees plus the fan angle. So approximately one half of the rotation time is going to be the amount of time it takes to acquire enough projections to reconstruct your data set. So if you have one source, you have to travel uh, around that object one half, basically uh, 180 degrees. Now, if you have dual source technology, what you can do is you can travel in a quarter of the amount of time because one source is going to capture 90 degrees. Simultaneously, another source is going to capture the adjacent 90 degrees. And so the temporal resolution goes from maybe 150 milliseconds like we see in most uh, single source technology scanners to 65, 75 milliseconds. So very, very quick acquisition times, which gives you much sharper detail because when you're talking about cardiac imaging, you're imaging a moving object. 
So Siemens are the only ones that make the dual source systems. Uh, the best one is the Force. That's their uh, flagship. They make a drive, which is the upgraded version of Flash. At Stanford, we have both Forces, uh, and uh, we also have a Flash, and we've had more than one. So when do you want to use diastole versus systole? Well, I like to think about diastole as the great place to look when you have low heart rates. And on a dual source scanner, you can define that as less than 65 BPM. On a single source scanner, you can define that as less than 60 BPM. And then in diastole, you'll get really good pictures. So you'll try and aim for that P wave right before the next R peak. Um, and if you image during systole, your images won't be as good. So generally speaking, if all you need is a static image, like for coronary imaging, uh, don't take your picture from there. Now, something interesting happens as your heart rate gets faster. Uh, it's not clear whether diastole or systole is going to be better. So uh, to be safe, we capture both diastole and systole when the heart rate increases to 66 to 85 beats per minute. And sometimes diastole looks better and sometimes systole looks better. And it's always best to capture both so that way you'll always have the information you need. And when the heart rates get really high uh, to 85 beats per minute, we find that systole is really the only place to look. And on single source technology, I would say probably don't try and perform a coronary scan or a calcium score at heart rates at 85 or greater. You're probably not going to get enough uh, spatial resolution or temporal resolution specifically uh, to identify how much calcium is in that object or are, if there are filling defects within that coronary artery. So greater than 85, generally we look at systole and we omit diastole because those uh, tend not to work very well. There's another fast mode of imaging. It's called flash mode and it's using the dual source tech technology and instead of using both of them uh, covering the same range what it does is it uses a super fast pitch and instead of using a pitch value of 0.2 like we generally use in retrospective dating or an axial slice where it's step and shoot which is essentially equal to a pitch of one or slightly less where it's moving the table the exact detector length now, this is basically moving at a pitch of 3.2. So on the force where you have a six centimeter detector and then you're moving that uh, at 3.2, that's giving you 19.2 millimeters per rotation and then the rotation times ridiculously fast like 0.25. So you get to these really fast scan times. But I will say that it's not quite the same as the wide detector technology because while you can have fast temporal resolution with the flash mode, it doesn't necessarily work the same way because it's not at the same part of the cardiac cycle when it's taking the pictures. And so it's the heart is morphing and changing in size. And any one of those pictures is going to be motion suppressed, but together they don't quite line up correctly uh, when you compare that to something like a wide detector system that can take the picture all in one, uh, all in one fail swoop. Now, if you can compare the two side by side, I would say that the wide detector mode is generally better when you have cardiac instability. Um, but the, the question here that you have to ask yourself is, do you want better spatial resolution or and better temporal resolution, or do you want better temporal uniformity? And so if you look at the, uh, the flash mode scan, it's got a really good sharp picture, but it doesn't line up correctly. And on the wide detector, it's kind of blurry, and that's because that object was moving at the time we were imaging it. And so that's kind of the trade-off that you have to think about when you're deciding to use your wide detector system or your dual source system, um, or if you're deciding on which one you want to buy. What problems do you see more often? Do you see arrhythmia more often, or do you see high heart rates more often? So uh, a couple of flash mode tip, uh, tips and tricks that can make your life a little bit easier um, is that every time you perform a flash scan, uh, you'll be asked to perform a flash check. And this flash check does two things. The first thing it does is it allows you to move your table uh, from the start and end of the, not the scan, but the running start and the running end, because you have to move the table so fast that even if you 
want to move only 14 centimeters for what you would see for a heart, you might end up having to move the uh, table 50 centimeters. And so you want to make sure you don't rip out any lines or any foldings. And so you can perform the flash check and make sure that you're not going to pull out any lines with a test run that you can easily stop with your move to scan button. And another thing it's going to do is it's going to uh, allow the system to identify if there's any heart rate variability. So it starts by playing the uh, auto voice and then it's going to wait for the heart rate stabilization. It's going to tell you whether or not it thinks you should scan your coronary uh, like that. And if, and if it thinks that you can scan your coronary, it'll give you this green light. If it doesn't, it'll give you this red light. And it'll say, we don't really recommend this for your uh, fast uh, scan mode of your coronaries. And I would say that in our application, we are not using uh, the flash mode in coronary scans. Uh, generally speaking, we're using the flash mode when we're doing uh, aorta scans. Uh, where we just need aortic suppression and if there's a little bit of motion in the coronaries that's not really the target here's another interesting tip when recon one has a heart in it you're going to leave it alone and recon two becomes your scan range now this does two things in retrospective gating mode it reduces the reference exposure value to 50 percent above and below this heart uh, region now, why do we want to do that? Now, this is an opportunity for us to reduce the radiation dose for the areas that don't require sub-millimeter resolution, spatial resolution specifically. And so if we're looking at the aorta and the aorta is above the heart, uh, then I might not need a lot of spatial resolution because the aorta is four centimeters wide. And if there's an aneurysm, it might even be five centimeters wide, whereas the coronary arteries may only have three or five pixels across and those will need more dose because they're much smaller objects and in the flash mode you use the same workflow but this time it's not to change the exposure setting to your patient at this point uh, the reason we're using the flash mode is it's telling the scanner when to arrive at the heart during the optimal cardiac phase which you can allocate in the scan protocol assistant not in the scan card itself but in the SPA, in the Scan Protocol Assistant page. Now, the, the main way that we use uh, our cardiac gating is in, in this retrospective spiral mode, or this multi-phase cardiac imaging mode. And, and doing this allows me to take pictures out of any one of these beats. But you can see that this red area, this is the radiation exposure to the patient, and this blue area, this right here, is actually my reconstruction. And so I'm really using all of these x-rays and only using this amount of data. Uh, and, and that can actually cause a problem, right? That's why coronaries were always seen as uh, really high dose radiation systems is because when you're applying this much radiation and you're only using this much, you have to ask yourself, is it really worth it? And uh, at the time when people were asking themselves this, the technology wasn't very good. They had single source detector systems. They had 0.5 second rotations. And things have changed quite a bit since then. But in retrospective gating mode, the way that it works is that your heart's beating and your table translation, which is this orange bar, has to contribute and get a whole heart cycle before it can move on to the next portion of the heart. And it's going to synchronize that with the ECG. And so if you have a really low heart rate, it's going to move really slowly. And if you have a really fast heart rate, the table is going to move faster. And another thing that we can do to reduce dose is if we know that uh, we want to get the entire heart cycle, but maybe we don't need to image during the beat itself, we can reduce the radiation dose outside of that. And so this is a window that um, can be described as 30 to 70% of the R to R cycle. Uh, and this window allows to reduce radiation dose. And you can still uh, capture really good pictures between the T and the P wave where a majority of your good images will be. Now, what happens if you get uh, an image that has uh, an uneven heartbeat? You have a really fast heartbeat right in between uh, two normal heartbeats. Well, your heart's not the same size, not the same shape, 
And so now your middle image no longer corresponds and lines up with what's above and what's below. And if there's pathology at one of those areas, you can't read it. So how do you solve this? Well, with retrospective gating, you don't have to rescan your patient. You can basically omit this reconstruction and force the scanner to reconstruct from the two adjacent uh, reconstruction windows. Well, how does that work? Well, you're moving over the heart very slowly, and so you can basically tell your system, don't use that central detector, use the peripheral detectors. And by using the peripheral detectors, we can capture that image uh, with less artifact. Now, here's a quick graph uh, that depicts what's going to happen with your heart rate. So this is a heart rate of 40. This is a heart rate of 100 on the horizontal axis. And these are our pitch values at 0.1. Uh, to 0 0.4. And you can see that with a, a heart rate of 40 beats per minute, we may have to use a pitch of 0.15 that corresponds to approximately uh, six times that we're going to have to scan that location in order to get through the entire heart cycle before we can move on. And so as we increase our heart rate, you can see the number of times that we have to oversample that region decreases from six uh, at 40 BPM to 3 at 100 BPM. Okay, so as heart rate increases, we don't have to stay over that range for as long. So this gives us faster imaging if the heart rates are fast, if we're using retrospective gaining mode. It doesn't make the images better, it just means they're faster. Now let's go ahead and troubleshoot how to register uh, and edit the ECG. So we have these blue balls over our R peaks. These are called sinks. Every scanner, every CT scanner that has a cardiac mode is going to allow you to basically define your R peak with something called a sink. So you'll have your sink. It's over your R peak. And you'll want to delete sinks that don't represent your R peak. So imagine you have a really noisy ECG signal and you want to get rid of that R peak because you know that's not real, right? This is just a noisy ECG. So you can right click on it, you can delete it, and your heart rate should, uh, again, respond normally and your reconstructions can come from the same place based on the actual heartbeats. Now, what if you're missing one? Let's say you have a really noisy signal and it doesn't see that R peak. Well, now, if you look at uh, the, the place our reconstructions are, let's say you programmed your system to give you 70% uh, percent of your R to R cycle, that corresponds to the P wave here, but because it doesn't see this R peak, it's gonna go ahead and look at 70% between here and here, assuming that's a heart rate, and it's gonna give you 70% of that area. So now you're putting diastole and systole together, and of course that's not gonna match. So you'll wanna make sure that you add a sync to every R peak. So, Another thing to keep in mind is that the system doesn't really know what's happening with the heart. It's only going to look at the sinks. And if you have a really noisy ECG signal, your images aren't going to come out very well. They're going to line up poorly because you're taking systole and diastole. So you can see systole is where these are narrow, diastole is when they're wide. You can see all of these little bumps. And unfortunately, because we didn't do a good enough job placing the the leads on, we couldn't get the pictures we needed. And of course, this heart rate information is not really correct, right? We didn't get a minimum of 29 and a maximum of 285. Nobody has 285 beats per minute. These aren't really R peaks. So if you can kind of identify where those R peaks are and you just find the highest and the lowest areas, this is a depolarization, and you find those sinks, and generally they're going to be pretty even. You find those things, you place your peaks over it, and now your heart's going to start to align to itself a little bit better because you're pulling images that are coming out of similar cardiac phases. And now you can see that now our heart rate is 43, max is 104, not 285, which is an enormous number that is frankly unbelievable. So you'll want to be able to troubleshoot your ECG. And the, the best way that I can tell you to think about this is when you're looking at your ECG signal, the very beginning of your scan is going to re represent the beginning uh, image. And so in this case, we're starting from the top and we're moving to the bottom. So the last reconstruction is coming from the bottom. So if you see a bunch of these artifacts, look at your horizontal um, 
ECG tracing and, and tell yourself, is this really accurate? And in this case, it's not. And you can tell why we're having all of these problems over here. Now, it's really important to get a good signal. And so here's some examples of where you might want to place your ECGs. So you want to put your white on your right and your black smoke over the red fire on the left and then the green grass, which is the ground lead underneath the white one. And you'll want to try and triangulate the heart. And if you can keep them offset, you'll reduce the beam hardening from the metallic clips at the very edge, right? And so let's say you place your leads on and they don't work. Well, then you can adjust them and try and get just a little bit closer to the heart, right? The closer you are to the heart, the better the signal you're going to get. And if this doesn't work, then you can adjust it again. Um, but again, you're, you're trying to triangulate the heart, so you might want to move more sideways onto the rib cage. Never put them on the stomach. Only put it on your arm if you have a pacemaker and you feel like your lead's touching the pacemaker and it's getting interference from the pacemaker itself. Generally speaking, you'll want to be close to the heart. And in terms of attire, uh, we use the acronym GOIF, gown open in front. That allows us to place the leads on comfortably without having to worry about placing the leads on, having the patients bring their arms up and having the gown pull the leads and removing the contact from the patient. Now, generally speaking, you should always have the arms up before you put the leads on, but some people can't handle uh, this because it hurts their shoulders. Now, keep in mind that you'll want the leads generally below your clavicle, and if your arms are down and you put the leads below your clavicle and you bring your arms up, they may end up above your clavicle. And the patient position is very comfortable. You need good shoulder support. You need to confirm that they can maintain that position and not move because the leads aren't very smart. They're measuring electricity and muscular movement is caused by electricity as well. It's not just heart electricity that those leads are causing. So patients can't move their arms during the cardiac scan. You'll want to place them as close to the heart as you can. You'll want to remove lotion and dead skin cells. You can use alcohol, um, but keep in mind that if you use alcohol, you might end up having to put some sort of uh, electro gel underneath uh, the metallic component to improve your signal. Uh, you'll want to make sure your patient can hear your breathing instructions as well and that they can comply with your breath holds, not only when you're in the room and talking to them or when you're on the microphone talking to them, but when you're on the microphone talking to them when your system is rotating and it's louder and then there's interference as well. You want to make sure your patients can hear you. So let's take a look at artifacts. So here's an example of a stack artifact where we have an image that's derived from two different heartbeats and it's not stacking. So let's say this is a four centimeter detector and it's, it's taking a picture and it's moving instead of four centimeters, it's moving maybe 3.8 centimeters and it's overlapping two areas. And if your patient's breathing or if your heart rate is uh, irregular, then you're going to get a double border. There's a way to fix that. So you can use the true stack option. The ones that I'm showing you in orange are the, the default on the Siemens systems, but we generally like to use the true stack icons, and that just basically pulls these apart. Does it get rid of the artifact? Not necessarily. You'll still have it, but you'll limit it to just where the detectors stack, and it'll be easier to visualize. And here's an example of that where we use 35% with a relative value, and we had irregular heartbeats, and then we used 330 milliseconds. Uh, absolute value with the true stack. So the absolute value is switching from percentage to milliseconds, and then we're using the true stack to reduce uh, the uh, number of images that come from two different uh, recon uh, bands. And you can see that we're improving the spatial resolution. And if you're thinking about a slight aortic tear, there's really only one way to do it. It's with that true stack technology in the systolic phase. Now here's a really good example of a perfectly gated cardiac scan. Both of these are perfectly gated. The volume rendered image with color is actually suffering from breathing artifact. There's nothing wrong with the gating. The patient couldn't hear the breathing instructions and subsequently was breathing. Now if you take a look at these two pictures, they're almost identical except one of them is using true stack. Now I would argue that the one that's using the blend looks better, but the one that's using the true stack allows you to visualize where those stacks are occurring. And in fact, they don't hinder the read at all. And so if you're going to have an artifact, you'd like to be able to define it as such 
rather than have an ambiguous transition that may cause you to miss subtle findings. And so you'll use your true stack technology to do that. We've embedded this into every one of our protocols. Here's an example of a stack versus a blend. We've got the blend on top and the stack on the bottom. Now, if you look at the heart chamber, you can see that with the blend, you have kind of a mild change. You've got noise changes here as well. It looks like there's maybe a filling defect or maybe there's a change in uh, iodine concentration and flow. But when you look at the stack on the bottom, you can see that, nope, the heart's just not lining up correctly. And that is definitely an artifact. And is there a calcification on the end of that? It's really hard to say, but if you use your multi-phase, uh, then you can gain some clarity on that. So relative values are really good for stable and slow heart rates. So you'll want to use your percentage for stable or slow heart rates. We always use this to find diastole. Um, and then we'll go ahead and switch to milliseconds whenever we have fast heart rates or whenever we have unstable heart rates, we'll use this to identify the best location. Um, and so get rid of the percentage, you'll use the millisecond value if you have heart rate instability and you wanna take pictures from roughly the same point. And that's essentially only gonna happen with milliseconds where you count the number of milliseconds. Because when you have an irregular heartbeat, it's the diastolic phase, the amount of time that the heart takes to fill that changes, but the beat itself is relatively stationary uh, and it's reproducible. And so if you just count X number of milliseconds afterwards, generally anywhere between 300 and 400 milliseconds, you're going to get a better reconstruction. Now, another thing you have to keep in mind is that you need to evaluate your images along the Z axis for artifacts in your 3D card. And so if you look at this image, we have uh, a wildly uh, bad ECG signal, there's noise, there are sinks where they don't belong. And if you zoom into the images, the axial image actually doesn't look too bad. I mean, the contrast is in the wrong spot, right? It's not in the left hand side, but there's not a whole lot of motion. But when you look at the coronal view, it looks terrible. And you're only going to really be able to differentiate between uh, artifacts in your cardiac scan mode and stacks um, in, in the plane. Uh, perpendicular to the artifact. So in this case, the artifacts are going to be uh, table axials. And so if I skip through here, uh, I might or might not see it in the axials, but one image in the coronal or sagittal plane will do that for me. So here's another example. After I fix it, look how much better things line up. Um, it's really important to cross-check uh, through plane. And so for this, you can create your reconstruction, copy it into a new recon, and then put on your 3D card, and then you can look at your coronal and sagittal in addition to your axial. An easier way to do this is to actually use um, this tool right here. This is called the Direct Viewer. And if you click on that and you have several recons open, you can choose the recon that you want to use. In this case, Yogi Bear Loves Honey is the name of a recon. Uh, this could be my diastolic phase. It could be my systolic phase. I could switch from these. It'll give me this volume. I do one left click on that volume and then it gives me a MIP and then I can just pull this to the left or to the right to cycle through the MIP and that's going to give me uh, my ability to understand if the heart is lining up with itself. Are there smooth borders or are there jagged borders? That's really the key. Now if you throw a multi-phase in here, you can use these arrows to jump through the phases. Uh, you can use this rotation tool to rotate your 3D card. You can use your auto tool to essentially get rid of everything but the heart, to auto segment the heart. You can click on these kidneys to change your volume rendered setting, but it's not really for uh, visualization. It's just a quick check to identify if everything looks like it's gonna line up. You wanna do that through plane. Now let's uh, take a look at how we view the images. So the first image is gonna be the beginning of your ECG trigger card. And then your last image is going to be at the end. Um, and you also get an ECG report, and that's going to show you the same thing, where your first image is at the top and your last image is at the end. It's going to give you some more options here on your ECG card, and I think that this is really useful, your ECG report. It's going to give you a scale showing you what one second is, so you can compare that to identify how fast or slow the heartbeat is. It's also going to tell you the, when the x-ray started, 
and subsequently how many seconds you waited, right? Because we now have scale. So one, two, three, four. So we've got eight seconds approximately before the scan starts. It's going to show you your down regulation. It's going to show you your full dose. So down regulation is dotted and full dose is uh, thick. And so you can use this to identify where your artifacts are. And if you look carefully, you'll see these numbers over each one of these recon bars. These are image numbers for that specific series. So in series labeled retrogated chest 075BB363 um, best S, uh, you can tell that if I have an artifact in image 125, I need to look here. Or if I have an artifact in image 34, then I need to look here. And that gives you an opportunity to start to identify where you need to fix your, uh, your system. So let's dive into this artifact. This was done for a topper workup. And the first thing that I noticed were these jagged edges. And these jagged edges are a classic sign of breathing artifact. You can see the sternum isn't lining up. And essentially what's happening here is as you breathe in and out, it's not just that Things are moving up and down, but they're also moving in and out. So you've got this circular pattern uh, that's actually moving the object into two different places and being imaged two different times. Let's take a look at the aortic valve, right? This is where we want to deploy a valve. So this is the shape of it. And I can't measure this and tell a surgeon exactly what type of uh, valve he needs to deploy uh, based on its size and shape because I don't have a good understanding of that. But I can identify that there are artifact lines located here. And so these are showing me that I have uh, opportunities to resolve this issue because I know where my recons are and where my stacks are. So if you count these four calcifications, what you can find is if you edit this correctly and identify where they are in relation to the stacks, they're really only three of these calcifications and I didn't fix the breathing artifact I just moved it by telling it not to use the reconstruction that was in the middle and so this gave me a better look at the aortic valve so let's take a look at how I did that well I had this artifact uh, from that guy in the middle so I got rid of him I blocked the central detector and I said reconstruct from the recons on both both sides of that problem area to identify what's actually happening in that anatomy. And one thing you want to keep in mind is as your table is moving because you're using a spiral mode, those lines will move as well. And so you can basically find a phase in systole that gives you what you need to see with the line above or below that object. Now, in order to fix this, there are several recons here, but I'm going to make it real simple. I knew that my problem was coming uh, out of image 120, right? So let's get rid of all these guys and just find the heartbeats that are part of that, right? And I can say, hey, just go ahead and get rid of where image 120 was coming from. And that's what I did. I just got rid of it. And by doing so, I was able to get uh, good images. And now basically what I'm going to see is that I have image 112 and 113 uh, coming from here, and I'm skipping this heartbeat as if it didn't exist altogether. Now, getting rid of this alone won't make me skip this heartbeat because they're always looking at the relationship between the R peaks. And so you're going to have to do a few more things here, right? The first thing you'll have to do is you'll switch your best phase to manual. You'll use your millisecond unit value and you'll type in a value that corresponds to the T wave. And in this case, it's 340 milliseconds after every R peak. We skipped the one that was troubling us because we deleted it, but the system is set to do what it needs to do. And so essentially, if you look at your ECG signal, you find that T wave. And generally speaking, you'll just move it and you'll find it right at the end of the T wave, just like that. Now, we talked about how as pitch increases, uh, it does so because the heart rate is increasing. And um, the number of times that you're scanning with high heart rates decreases dramatically. And so we were able to resolve that last one because we had a slow pitch and a relatively low heart rate at the time that we loaded the scan. But if I had a fast heart rate, like a heart rate 
of uh, 80 or 90, uh, and I tried to pull out one of those sinks, I wouldn't have enough information. And it would take the last image from this beat and the last image from this beat, and it would merge them together and interpolate, and I would have no data on either side of that. So you'll want to make sure that if you have a really fast pitch, uh, sometimes this won't work. Now again, you have to start off correctly, so make sure your skin prep is secure and uh, your leads are fastened down. Sometimes you can put some extra tape above and below. Now, what if you choose your best diastolic or your best systolic and you still can't make heads or tail of that coronary artery? Well, you can use another tool on the scanner that's called the preview series tool, which is similar to the tool that your radiologist is going to use uh, when he's visualizing that zero to 90 face scan in his uh, fancy viewer, whether that's Terra Recon or AW or Single Via, uh, etc. So the way that this tool works is that you'll find that area of motion and then you'll type in uh, your best phase of manual and you'll set your, uh, your phase start to uh, the beginning. In our organization, we, we ask it to go 20 above and 20 below our phase start. And so we just find the highest dose region, right? We don't necessarily want to look in this white region where we're down regulating 20%. So in this case, I type in 50 because that's halfway between 30 and 70. And then I can hit this preview series button, which is this little guy above the direct viewer. And then I can toggle the image here, and it's going to give me multiple images in the exact same location across the cardiac phase cycle. And I can locate the best image here, and at that point, I'll just type it into my phase start. It'll tell me the phase at the bottom of the image. I'll type it into my phase start, and then I'll reconstruct it, and it'll be magic. I'll get great pictures. Now, there are some advanced CT applications and technologies that are coming to play all over the world. Uh, here's one of them. It's called CTFFR. This is a technology that was initially done in the cath lab, and it allows people to identify whether or not these stenoses are meaningful and impacting the blood flow into the myocardium. So I've got a curved planar reformation that I've stretched out, and you can see that there's a calcification, but I don't have any narrowing of the vessel, so it's not necessary to treat this. And so if I can use this FFR technology to measure the flow of blood distal to those types of uh, calcifications, and if I can find out there is good flow after those, then there is no reason for me uh, to send this patient to the cath lab. And it, subsequently, if I take that uh, FFR and it turns out that I've got low flow after a given uh, calcification or stenosis, whether it's soft or hard plaque, then that patient should go to the cath lab. So you can perform this with good quality diagnostic CTs. And so this is a technology that we're offering at Stanford and is uh, being used worldwide. Another cool technology that isn't necessarily being used everywhere that's really helpful is myocardial CT. Now we've done SPECT for a long period of time, but in CT you can actually get the anatomical regions and you can identify if there's a filling defect and the subsequent areas where we have decreased blood flow into the left ventricle. And so CT gives you that anatomical data in addition to the physiologic data of the blood flow into the myocardium. And why not do it with CT and get your one-stop shop, get your anatomy and your physiology all in one place. So here's an example of an exam that we, uh, that we used uh, myocardial perfusion for. We presented this in 2018 at RCNA. So Here's a 65-year-old man. He's had shortness of breath. It's been getting worse. He's got atypical chest pain for several months. He had a stress echo, and it was normal when he was resting, but he did have some septal motion uh, defects during stress that indicated that he may have a myocardial bridge or something might not be completely correct. So the stress echo gives us really good physiologic information, but zero anatomical information, right? So they sent him to us for CT and RPI recruited him for this perfusion study. Uh, so the patient had a calcium score, he had a CT coronary exam, and then we performed a stress myocardial perfusion CT. And here are our findings. So he had a calcium score of 97, which isn't too bad. That puts him in his 55% rank. 
But if you look at where the calcium is, it's pretty interesting. There's nothing in the left main, which is great. That's exactly what you want to see. You never want calcifications in your left main, right? That's the widow maker. And the LED had 36. That's the main uh, vessel uh, that goes along the front of the left side, the most important side. That uh, didn't have a lot. It had 36. The circumflex had 52, and that's quite a bit. And then the right coronary had eight, right? So it's strange that most of the calcium's uh, deposits are in the circumflex. Here are some curved planar reformations from our CT coronary. And you can see that there are some soft plaques that the calcium score was not able to detect. So you can see these mild uh, filling defects here. Those are the plaques that you worry about that could rupture potentially and then block down, down the line. It's not a, a large amount, right? It's not 50% stenosis, but it's meaningful and it's there and it's distal to a calcification. Here's the LED. The LED looks great. Um, I almost don't see any calcium in, in these pictures. It looks wonderful. The volume render looks good. And there's a little bit of narrowing, but it's, it's nothing to be worried about. And then here's the circumflex. And the circumflex is worrisome because you can see it coming off the left main. You can see that it gets narrow. There's a calcification. It goes down, gets even more narrow, and almost disappears completely. If you look at the volume rendered image, it, it does not look very healthy. And so the calcium score actually had a lot of really good information because it kind of uh, guided us towards thinking, hey, maybe there's something not so healthy about that, uh, that circumflex artery. And then we perform the myocardial CT in which we inject contrast and we have the patient hold their breath during this exam. Uh, and we give them oxygen so that they can hold their breath. And here are two views. Here's a, basically a, a a long axis view and then the short axis view. And you're not looking at the blood flow into the heart, you're looking at the myocardium of the left ventricle. So you see this U-shaped object here? This is the left ventricle. And you can see that it actually kind of changes a little bit and blood flows into it. And here's that basically, uh, if, if you think about uh, a perpendicular view, this region is the left ventricle. And when we process this over time, uh, we get this image, which shows us really good perfusion here, decent perfusion here, but really bad perfusion here. And this is actually where the circumflex is. And so there's a lot of really good physiologic information you can get by performing uh, this type of exam, a myocardial perfusion exam uh, with CT, uh, or the FFR could show you uh, that there's lower flow to this region. Uh, so some of these future technologies can be really helpful none of which will be helpful if you can't get a good coronary CT and a good cardiac CT. And in order to do that, there are plenty of modes. We prefer the retrospective gating mode. You'll need to know how the ECG syncs work and how to adjust those. You'll need to know when to apply the percentage versus the millisecond unit values. You'll need to be able to identify cardiac artifacts in relation to the ECG. And the best way to do that is to look through the plane at a coronal or a sagittal and we've also touched on some integration of future technologies. And if there's one thing that I can teach you is if you have an irregular heartbeat, if you have instable uh, arrhythmia, one thing that you can do is you can manually place your reconstructions at the end of the T wave somewhere in this general region, and that will give you really good pictures. So with that, I thank you very much for your time.